Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I mean, it's a pleasure for us at the Georgetown Americas Institute uh, to host Enrique Krause. Enrique Krause is a Mexican historian, historian, essayist, editor, and entrepreneur. He has written more than 20 books. Uh, we can mention among them Mexico Biography of Power, Redeemers, El Pueblo Soy Yo, and more, more recently, Espinosa en el Parque México. He received his BA in Industrial Engineer, Engineering at, at UNAM. Then he received a PhD in History at the Center of Historical Studies at El Colegio de México. He's a member of the Mexican Academy of History, the Mexican National College. He's the director of the publishing house Rio and director of the literary and current issues magazine Letras Libres. The engineer faculty, shortly before the start of the Mexican movement of 1968, elected him university counselor. In 1979, he obtained the Guggenheim Fellowship. He has been a professor and researcher for the Colegio de Mexico, guest professor at San Antonio's College, Oxford, and also guest professor at Princeton several times. He started working at Vuelta, Octavio Paz uh, magazine in 1977. He collaborated there for more than 20 years, first as an editorial secretary from 1977 to 1981, and then as a deputy director from 1981 to 1996. In 1991, he launched the publishing house and television producer house Kilo, of which he's a director. Since 1999, after Octavio Paz passed away, he has directed Vuelta, Vuelta's Cultural Fair in Letras Libres, with editions in Mexico, Spain, and online. Since 1985, he has been an editorial writer for the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, El País, and Reforma. In 1990, he was elected member of the Mexican Academy of History, and since 2005, he's a member of El Colegio Nacional in Mexico. He's also a member of the Board of Directors at the Instituto Cervantes. He has, I mean, gotten a, a, a number of a, honorary degrees and awards. But, I mean, we're very glad to, to have Enrique Krause with us for this conversation on his work, his career, and also about the current events in Latin America and obviously in Mexico. So welcome, Enrique, and thank you all for coming. So at, at the end of the presentation, I mean, Enrique wanted to do this more as a conversation than uh, just a, a presentation or a speech by, by him. So we will have a, a, a conversation and then we will have time for a Q&A session with the, with the audience. And I thought it was uh, important to begin with your latest book, Espinosa en el Parque México, that uh, it has been called an intellectual biography structure around your conversations with the Spanish intellectual Jose Maria Lasalle. In the first part of the book, you go into great detail of your upbringings as a first generation Jewish Mexican. And you also you go into great length in describing how your views were shaped first by your grandfather and afterwards by Daniel Cosío Villegas, Luis González y González, Octavio Paz, Gabriel Said, and many others. Can you share with us a little bit the story behind the title of the book? That I mean, as we don't have an English version yet, I'm sure I mean a lot of people here have not read it. So, and then maybe, I mean, if you give us a description of your a, a personal upbringings, but also your intellectual upbringings that you describe so beautifully in the book. Well, first of all, Alejandro, thank you very much. And, and I'm very pleased to be here. So many young uh, faces, and, and I feel this is a, a kind of family reunion because I have so many friends that live here, very dear friends, with me uh, this evening. Uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, in those 15 months, I had uh, uh, but two choices. Either 
I, I go mad or I would write my uh, memoirs. So my wife and I locked ourselves, possibly in our house, and I had my library, my books, and my memories. And so uh, I, I had um, I had a conversation with a Spanish uh, writer who wanted to write my biography. Uh, I don't know what he wanted to do that, but he did. And I had those those materials, and I started to write a biography uh, in a conversational form. And it is, uh, the title is Spinoza in El Parque, Mexico, because my grandfather was a modest Jewish tailor, but he had a fine library in Yiddish, and he was very, very, uh, he was a student of Spinoza, the, the famous uh, uh, Jewish philosopher of the 17th century, uh, who in many ways was a founder of liberalism. Uh, and and, uh, and he, he always taught me, um, since I was very young, and those lessons were given by him to me in the Parque Mexico, a very small park uh, in, in Mexico City that was very typical, uh, very, very important for the uh, Jewish community at that time. So we used to stroll there to the streets and he used to tell me his, the, his, his views on Spinoza and his life and the way Spinoza defended freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of belief, freedom. So I think my first teacher of freedom was my grandfather. And that in homage, in homage to, to, to my grandfather, my, uh, uh, that, that's the reason of the title. Then I have a lot to have other grandparents, uh, um, not uh, in my family, but in my intellectual family, which were important people in Mexico. Daniel Cosio Villegas, great essayist, editor, historian. Uh, Manuel Gómez Morín, the founder of, the, of so many institutions in Mexico, among them El Banco de México and the, El Partido Acción Nacional, and then also Octavio Paz, of course, not very much like my grandfather, he wasn't that old, but he could have been my father. He never treated me as a son, I never treated him as a father. He was my friend and my teacher, and, and, and I was the deputy editor of Passes magazine. So as you see, how lucky I was uh, to be able to be a young man uh, in the 60s and 70s and the early 80s, because the book, it, it, I finished the book in the early 80s when I was around 35. So it's a book about my upbringing, intellectual upbringing. So, and it's also how much to those uh, very important uh, tutelar figures, but also uh, to their thought, their works, their institutions. And also in the book, what I did is to read again those books that I read when I was young and talk about them now that I have the age uh, uh, in, in my mid seventies, and, and 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 think about that young man. So I grabbed the, the books of Hannah Arendt and Walter Benjamin and Isaiah Berlin, people that I knew, people that I read, and I saw what what kind of uh, pencil writings I had done. So it was fun, and the product of that is this. Strange, very thick, a bit dense, but for some, but 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 its conversational form uh, gives it some lightness, I hope. And uh, well, this is a story of Spinoza and El Parque Mexico. Thanks, and we can, it's, uh, as, as I said, I mean, it's a, a, it's a great uh, hook for the book because I, I, I think, I mean, the the story of your family, of your immigrant family in Mexico, uh, the story of many 
migrants in Mexico from different communities that, as you say, crossed each other in El Parque Mexico and many other parks in, in, in Mexico City, and how, I mean, from a, a, how many of you ended up becoming, I mean, very influential and relevant a, a elements of our, of our society. And in that, you also play homage to El Colegio de Mexico and the Spanish exile in Mexico. And, and you say in passing that uh, the, the influence of the Spanish exiles in Mexico has not been sufficiently valued, neither in Spain nor in Mexico. Why is that the case? And, and can you tell us a little bit more about our contribution to Mexico yeah. and to Spain? I was very fortunate uh, uh, to study in El Colegio de Mexico, which at that time, still it's an important institution, but of course, I think it was much more uh, universalist and, and important and intellectually dense in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and it was founded by Cosío Villegas and Alfonso Reyes, the great Mexican writer, but as a refugee for all those Spanish, great Spanish intellectuals that uh, writers, thinkers, translators, editors, historians, philosophers, sociologists that came to Mexico in the late 30s, uh, escaping from, uh, took refuge in Mexico from the Spanish uh, Civil War. One of them, for instance, was uh, Jose Medina Echevarria. He translated Max Weber 20 years before Talcott Parsons translated Max Weber. They were an extraordinary generation. I had the luck of uh, meeting a few of them, and I would say arguably the most brilliant of them, uh, Jose Gaos, who was a direct the disciple of Jose Reyes said, so I can boast uh, metaphorically in, in a way uh, one of the many grand intellectual grand sons of, uh, of that great philosopher. But the way they studied history and literature, sociology, and, and even philosophy was something deeply important for Mexico. Aside from that, uh, Cosío Villegas founded El Fondo de Cultura Económica. El Fondo de Cultura Económica was the most important humanistic publishing house in Spanish-speaking world in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. I have no doubt about that. When Spain was in the darkness of uh, the war and then Franquismo, when in Latin America you had all those un unstable governments, even in Argentina, Peronismo, the great light of editorial uh, and publishing um, uh, production was El Fondo de Cultura Económica. It, it was founded by my teacher, Cosío Villegas, and all the translators of the German, French, uh, English, you, you name them, um, uh, texts from Mannheim to Weber to Marx to David Ricardo, all the classics were translated by whom? By the Spanish writers. So it was a marvelous time. And let's say I was in the Colegio de Mexico the morning after. So I could still give them or I was uh, disciple of uh, disciple of, of their disciples. So yeah, we, we talk, this also I touch some of this in, in in the book, and it was as I say very important. And and even now, even now we we'll talk. We'll get to that huh? Mexican politics, regretfully, but we have to get to that. Even now, the institutions that were founded by the people that I met. Some of them, people like Manuel Gomez Morini and Cosio Villegas, who were actually the protagonists of my first books. 
those people, those th th uh, that were born at the end of the 19th century, that lived through the revolution when they were very young, the first thing they did is to start founding, establishing institutions. I could go on one hour to mention all those institutions, but El Banco de México, El Seguro Social, all the institutes that have to do with public health, education, culture, editorial houses, businesses, all sorts of institutes, they still are the structure that in spite of this last year's uh, still has Mexico on its feet. Well, thanks. Let, let's continue before we go into current events and, and yeah. Mexican, uh, uh, the situation in Mexico and, and what do you expect or what do you see the, the greatest risks for Mexico's, Mexico society? Let me continue a little bit on, on, on the book. I, I think for the public to, to get to know a little bit more about what, what you tell in the book, your story, and, and how you became a historian after study. I mean, it's, it's not that common path to be an engineer. Well, what, yeah. well here comes the animals. I'm, I'm, I'm a son. My grandfather was a tailor. My father had a printing business. He founded a, with a small machine, a printing business. And he was successful. And, and, and so when I was young, uh, when I was a kid, I, I used to work in that printing business. We did holding boxes for the cosmetic industry, which was very useful for me when I was young because I could buy very cheap those cosmetics perfumes and give them to my girlfriend or whatever. So uh, the, uh, my wife who's here, she always laughs when I go into a store like Macy's or whatever, and I go into a, a place where the, the cosmetics are, and I immediately feel hypnotized. Oh, this, this, for, this, this box, we did it. This, we did it. No? So that's the romantic part. And that business um, sadly fell apart when I was 20, and I had to take over uh, to save that business with my father for many years. So I, I, I have always earned my life as an independent businessman, first with my father, and then with my own businesses. Uh, documentary business, the, 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 the um, and, 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 and the magazine print and La Olimeta Libres. So I became, um, uh, I had, I, I, I was an engineer because it was, I was supposed to do the, we heard that, 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 that business, no? With the sad story that when I was 20, my father said, I think we are rather broke. So what are we going to do? So we devoted many years for that. So I had to develop a, a new life, a parallel life. And that parallel life is uh, to become a historian because I have always loved history because in the Jewish school in Mexico, the obsession was literature and history. El Colegio Solito de Mexico was a, a, a wonderful school where you didn't learn much about science and mathematics, but you did learn about literature and history. So I became uh, kind of obsessed or enchanted with history. And it was, to sum up, it was a very easy, very natural, quite natural, to fall in love with Mexican history, a history as fascinating, as deep, as complex as the Jewish history. So the trans translation, that the, 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 the passing from the interest in Jewish life, Jewish history, the Mexican history, both in my millennial histories, was very simple. So I became a Mexican historian. And then, of course, was the other dimension, politics. No, because I wasn't an academic historian, politics. Why? Because Octavio Paz and I, and our magazine in the 70s, had one task very clear, to defend liberty 
freedom and democracy, when liberty, freedom and democracy was were even less recognized as important as they are now. Even less, because the main trends in Latin America were, were the revolution, those were the dogmas, the myths, the revolution, social revolution, Marxist revolution, or, or dictators, or the three, which was a combination. We were against all of them. And if we were not popular, uh, we are not popular, even now, but it was wonderful to have that experience. It's, so you, it's marvelous. Bertrand uh, Russell wrote a book on popular essays. What a title. So you maybe you jump one step that I thought you were getting into it when you said it was easy the transition from your love of literature and history and, and the history of the Jewish people to the history of Mexico. Then you said there was another transition. I thought you were going to talk about uh, why did you become also a biographer? Because you have said impossible to reduce history to a biography, but without biography, there's no history. So biography and history. How did you choose that? Um, it's a mistake to reduce history to biography. It's a very common mistake. But it's wrong also to forget biography and think that biography or, or, or representative or important lives are not um, significant, uh, a significant part of history. But the reason was, well, I, I, I seem to had this vision that I would be very, I was very interested in individual lives. And um, I, I don't really know from where does it come about, but one thing is clear, in a country like Mexico, and in a continent like Latin America, but in a country like Mexico, where power has been so concentrated, in the caudillos or the presidents since the 19th century, it was clear that if one, if I, I had clear the idea that if I could try a new approach, a new modern biographical approach in order to understand those men, starting from Mercurio Hidalgo and Morelos uh, to Carlos Salinas de Gortario, Presidents and Caudillos and Warriors and Juarez. I simply wanted to understand, understand, not judge, understand, which is uh, the, 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 the meaning, the sense of their lives, the inner sense of their lives. So I approached them, and that's why I wrote Biography of Power, no? And I told them Biography of Power. And it's not called Biographies of Power. It's called biography of power, because in, in a way, the power of one man has been all important in Mexico, generally with terrible consequences. And let me tell you that I thought, I published the book in Spanish for many years, but in English it was in 1997. And I thought, this is an obituary of Mexico's biography of power. Since Mexico is now uh, in a clearly in the transition democracy, we will have presidents, yes, but not as powerful. So we won't have a biography of power. Power will be shared with the Congress and with the judiciary and with the press and Mexico will be a modern country where not one single man can rule the lives and decide the destiny of the whole country. Well, I was wrong. So the five years now, the, the uh, administration, let's call it that way, uh, administration, 
uh, of uh, you know, the current president uh, has proven clearly that in spite of the democratic uh, progress that Mexico has had in its structure, it's very clear that there is like a, a kind of historical instinct, an undercurrent, a, a very strong undercurrent, and there are very strong, deep reasons for that, why Mexico is still struggling not to be a biography of power. And I mean, maybe you, you, you already touched upon that, but I mean, given that you, you, you already jumped into the present stage of Mexican politics and, and Mexican democracy and, and the risks that Mexico, the, the present issues that are faced by the concentration of power by the current uh, government and the risks that we face into the future. I think it's it's a good it's a good moment to remind you of what you said in 2006 when you thought it was imminent that Lopez Obrador was going to win the election. He won it, he won it in 2012. I will conclude your essay. Let me just uh, read it. Uh, you said the most likely outcome of the election is still the triumph of López Obrador. That was in 2006, but it happened in 2012. In that case, Mexican democracy will face a new and momentous challenge. Unaided by the people, as he will no doubt experience his election, López Obrador could be tempted to dissolve democratic institutions, including the ban on re election in a single blow or leading by will. Certainly seems to be the way of Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, the historic leader of the Mexican left. Recently, Cárdenas made clear to me in conversation that he does not dismiss the possibility of his own discipline, perpetuation in power, perhaps his right, whoever heard of it, unlimited messiah. And then you say, I do not mean to be too disturbed. The political institutions of Mexico now place powerful obstacles in the way of dictatorial design. The separation of powers, the autonomy of the judiciary, the newly won freedom of the press, the universally respected Federal Electoral Institute, and the Bank of Mexico. The economy is largely privatized and diversified, and federalism is a tangible reality. Governors and states have significant degree of power in relation to the central government. In addition to historic protagonists, the church and the army would represent a limit to any pretension to absolute power. The church has already announced its firm support to pay respect to the popular vote. This was in 2006. And the military is professional and apolitical. Again, this was 2006. Most of all, Mexico can count on its citizenry. It has taken almost a century for the country to transition peacefully to democracy. Mexicans know this and they value it. So, having gone through five years of Lopez Obrador staring, at the election in 2024, how do you see this in retrospect? Which institutions have held well? Which institutions have been partially or totally destroyed? And how would you reshape what you were back then? That was pretty visionary of what we have been going through. Well, without dodging the answer, let me just go back for a second to give a broader perspective. Since 1968, my generation was very active in criticizing the PRI. Some thought that the way out was for the PRI uh, to become a more clear left-wing party, and they were thinking of the socialist paradigm. It was not my case. I thought that the way out, you know, Caritas thought that in the Nelco there were many people who thought that, but in my generation was a very uh, a rebellious generation, the 60s. Uh, they thought the, the path was revolution. So in the 70s and the 80s, in my generation, we had 
an immense sympathy. They had an immense sympathy for El Salvador, Nicaragua, Cuba. The Sandinistas were, they were, well, they were the heroes of the 68 generation. Uh, the guerrillas in El Salvador. Well, we in the 80s thought that that was wrong and we published it and we paid a deal price because for instance in 1985 octavio Paz's image was burned in front of his house for having asked for elections free elections in nicaragua when you see what's happening in nicaragua who was right but at that time they burned his effigy in front of his house. Okay. At the same time, we not only criticized, we reported the truth about the Argentinian and Chilean dictatorship. I went there in 1979 and, and wrote a long reportage. Vuelta was banished from those countries which is a banner of honor. So not with the guerrillas, not with the uh, uh, generals, but not with the pre either. Because we knew that the pre was a subtler dictatorship, a perfect dictatorship. That's how uh, Mario Vargas Llosa called it, the, the perfect dictatorship. So we wanted to elections an independent electoral institute, freedom of the press. Those were our modest goals. Those goals were achieved to the extent that in history things are achieved. Seemed to be achieved in 1997-2000. But then we had to live in democracy. And in that sense, of course, President Fox and Calderon, and much more so Peña Nieto, were disappointing for several reasons. In my opinion, much more uh, uh, Calderon, um, Peña Nieto, because this is the plea that mm, the people gave the plea the vote. It's like saying, okay, okay, you've been, you were in power 71 years, we know, you, you did some good things, but you were corrupt, you were all this, but we'll give you a second chance. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things in life where if you give a second chance and you fail the second chance, that's it. That's it. That explains the victory of Lopez Obrador, among many things in 2018. Now, about your question, 2006, I had admiration. I had met briefly Lopez Obrador in 2004. I admired, and I told him I admired, his social vocation. I saw him as a new kind of Cardenas. In Mexico is very important for the people who feel the closeness of the of the leader of, of the president. He had that sensibility. And I thought he was a right man. But then, to make the very long story very short, I started to watch him act in tiny, tiny details, attitudes, the rely of a biographer, you know? how he responded, how he acted, how he reacted, how he was so easy to get mad. Uh, and I started reading his book. And I simply sensed that there was a very, very, uh, it, was, it was clear that we have a, an authoritarian personality. an authoritarian personality. 
And well, it's not very difficult to understand why uh, the son and, and grandson of a Jewish family in the 20th century has some kind of sensibility to authoritarian personalities. So I sensed here I have an authoritarian personality. And in Latin America, we have had Castro and we had Chavez there. Well, that's why I wrote the piece called El Messias Tropical, the tropical messiah. He took it as an insult. It was not an insult. It was a deeply researched essay, seriously researched essay. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that he has felt always as the messiah of Mexico. Uh, and the word tropical, it's not mine, it's his. He wrote, he wrote a book on the tropical power. And he says, we in Tabasco are very prone of tropical power, like in the Caribbean, like the rivers, the tempestuous rivers of Tabasco. That's how we are. But I didn't like those tempestuous um, 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 attitudes in Mexican politics. And I was not only skeptical, but full of, of fear. And that's why I wrote the piece. And all of what has happened is that he has never forgotten or forgiven that piece. But I don't regret having written it, and I, uh, I, uh, I, it's it's almost eighteen years. It'll be next year, and I think it's uh, it hasn't lost its uh, its its basic truth. No, that's what I think. Uh, and uh, and then I I started uh, immediately. Was so scared of what had happened that I went to Venezuela and they both took a year to study Venezuela and wrote a book called El Poder y el Delirio. And well, there I was studying the family, you know, uh, Chavez and 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 and, and Lopez Obrador and some others were the populists, you know, and 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 it's a family, it's a it's a family of charismatic leaders that Max Weber had had studied in the in the uh, uh, start of the century in his sociology. And here we have it in Latin America. So this is the not too short answer to your very concrete question. Okay, so so we try to get a little bit more concrete. I mean, in that last paragraph, because I, I totally agree with you, 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 with those tiny observations, you nail Lopez Obrador down extremely well at that moment. Before Correa, before the uh, Kirchner, I mean, we, uh, uh, I think for some of us now, it's easier to see some of those traits, yes. given that we can pick from Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, from Chavez, from at that time, I think it was much, much harder. And you concluded with, I think, uh, that paragraph that also was visionary in, in saying that some of the institutions that Mexico was building ended up being significantly strong to withstand some of these, uh, of the onslaught, but others weren't. Yeah. And some that we thought were never going to get co-opted are the ones that have been the most cozy to this on onslaught. No? And, and, and in that sense, uh, do you think another six years of this is going to completely overpower these institutions? Uh, uh, I, what is your view of the current state of the democratic institutions? I, I, I think we're touching the, the we're touching the problem of Mexico right now. In spite of its very violent history. Uh, complex history, tragic history. 
since the mid 19th century, Mexico has been a country that has been able to build institutions. This is not something uh, that happens in every Latin American country. In the 20th century, Mexico built some very important and strong institutions almost in every aspect of the our public and private life. As I said, health, culture, education, finance, banks, uh, uh, you name them. I, I, editorial houses, businesses, the Tecnológico de Monterrey, Monterrey, the University of Mexico, el Instituto Politécnico Nacional, el Fondo de Cultura, I could go on and on. The three, which I didn't particularly love, was an institution with the strangest name of them all, El Partido Revolucionario Institucional, a contradiction in terms. But it was an institution, and it was founded by Plutarco Elias Calles, who was truly a visionary. And you know what he said in 1928? Let's finish the time of the caudillos. Let's start the time of the institutions. There are very few countries in Latin America that have had every six years a new president since 1934. It's our case. I would say, in a way, thanks to the point, until recently, and then to the transition to democracy that after all happened, it happened. The we didn't allow the elections. The we didn't allow uh, to have an independent institute. It didn't. But we had stability and it was an institution. It was not a movement. It was an institution. Workers, peasants, bureaucrats. Was it corrupt? Of course it was corrupt. We have corruption in every institution, yes, some more than others. But an institutional life is much more important than to have much, much better, less worse than to have a country led by one man and the movement and one man deciding the fate of a country. That was clear. Okay, what was my fear? in 2006, writing that piece, was that he would obviously go after the institutions. Because it is in the nature of a caudillo and a populist particularly to attack the institutions because institutions uh, mean limits to his power. So with, the, uh, uh, with his the power of communication, uh, he he simply shed a big uh, shadow of uh, um, of, of shame uh, to the institution. Say they're all corrupt, and he started damaging one by one. From the little ones, the big ones. For instance, from then, Fondo Nacional de Desastres Naturales. It was uh, so important because it was, it was the money that was needed when you had natural disasters. Look what's happening now. There's no condemn. There are many other, like the Institute of Transparency, of Energy, that he simply um, uh, made them more or less disappear. There were others that have resisted, like the Banco de Mexico, as I mentioned there. The army, that's very important. The army is 100 years old, the modern army in Mexico, completely institutional, but he has done everything in his hand to control the army by the very... The, the army has been 
a very exemplary institution in some aspects. For instance, it was the only army in Latin America that peacefully gave, the generals gave the power in 1946 to the civilians. 1946. And it's an army that was very obedient. But now he has given them huge um, budgets plus tasks that are not in the nature uh, or the task of the, 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 of the army, but they have to obey to build bridges and to build trains and to build refineries, who God knows, and divert their main objective, which is, for instance, save people in case of disasters. And, well, so the institution of the army it is damaged, but not destroyed. Then he wanted to take over, to destroy the Electoral Institute. He couldn't do, do it, but it was a miracle. A miracle. I won't tell me that, but it was very, very difficult. And then he has been doing everything in his power to harm the judiciary. Not unlike Netanyahu did in Israel. He hasn't been able, but he has, he's still there trying to harm it. Well, we need more. He rules the Congress. So he, I would say, Education, for instance, education is destroyed. The textbooks in Mexico now for the kids uh, could, could, could clearly be the official textbooks in Cuba or Venezuela. I mean, the chance for El Che Guevara and all that. Health, that is the most dramatic thing. Health. Health. Well, that means. The way they handled COVID was tragic. There were 800,000 people died around that. Many of them shouldn't have died. It would have had a sound policy. And of course, I, he dismantled the Mexican police. He gave the army uh, that power, but the army is not a police. So I would say, in one word, that the attack to the Mexican um, net of institutions that were brought and need through one century uh, has been has been very serious. Uh, the job hasn't been completed, thankfully, and I hope they will survive. Many of them. Uh, in the next six years. But the damage to the institutions in Mexico has been severe. Thanks. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, Mexico faces uh, in June 2024 uh, an, an election, a presidential election and a congressional election. I mean, the two main candidates are one from Morena, uh, Claudia Sheinbaum, uh, the former mayor of Mexico City and from the Alliance of the Opposition, Xochitl Galvez. And as we were discussing also, I mean, it is in the nature of, of these movements and regimes uh, not to let power go. No? And, and do you think that Mexico also faces the possibility of a, another institutional crisis during the elections? It's much easier to to write history and think about history in the past than to, to make prophecies. Although some prophecies sadly come true. Uh, I still believe that Mexico has that structure somehow. We have the Banco de Mexico, we have an electoral institute. Judiciary is resisting. We don't we have we don't have freedom, real freedom. We don't accept we don't see freedom uh, of expression clearly in the mass in in the in, in television. They're very constrained. But in radio and the press 
And of course, in the social media, it's much more widespread. So things, uh, the damage has been severe, but I think uh, the, the rule of the six years will be respected. 1934 until now, and we will have elections in June, June 2nd. And if they, as, as it seems, Claudia Sheinbaum, the official candidate of Morena, wins, in October 2024, she'll become president, the first president, woman president in Mexican history. And even if she doesn't want to, she will have to face many challenges and problems that will require some change of path. She knows that education is in crisis, that health is in crisis, that the sticking to both energies and oil is something irrational. There are many things that, no matter how ideologized she is, or she might be, I don't know her personally, I uh, have never met her, uh, she will have to, to see the truth and to act accordingly. If there will be a tension, a tension between her and her, uh, uh, and Lopez Obrador, I have no doubt that he will, I think he will, uh, it's in his nature to try to keep being an important force somehow. And well, it's in that scenario, it's not impossible to imagine at least a few years of tension. But the key is in the Congress, Mexican Congress. And if such Valdez and the opposition do fairly well, and they pull enough votes for making a much more diversified and plural Congress, both in the House of Representatives, but mainly in the Senate, that would mean, I would say, the, the balance of power that we need. And we would then be able to say that Mexican democracy is not in the um, in, 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 in the hospital in, 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 in the place of urgent and, and, and very seriously ill uh, uh, people, but in a very slow and difficult recovery. If such garbage wins by a very small margin, I don't see how this will be accepted by the government. And there will be some kind of turmoil and protest and social protests uh, and, 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 and and in, in the streets. No. So the best outcome that's good, that would be simply have a more balanced person and have such a wellness as a figure there. A respected figure, a female uh, figure, one of an outstanding career. As you know, she was an Indian upbringing, hardworking, very poor. She became an engineer and a very successful engineer and, and businesswoman. And she has a very clear conscience. She's charismatic. She's intelligent. She's bright. She can be also a an enemy of opposition. And if you have the, in this landscape, not anymore one man in stage. You have the president, you have Sochi, you have Congress, you have the judiciary. I think Mexico will still face, as I said in my piece, one generation at least to remove the institutions. At least. But we can uh, we can uh, we can do it. 
of the younger generations can do. But there are certain things I want to say. Oddly, because for some of you maybe that would think it this applicable of me, but in my piece and still now, I defend some things about Lopez Obrador. For instance, I think that the the way he gives money, I, I don't agree the way he gives it. However, I, I, I completely agree that um, giving money directly to the people. And there are reasons I don't want to worry about that. I think it is important and should have been done before. And it has been done before, but in, a, in the wrong way. And he did it in the wrong way too, because he charges with obedience, with political obedience. Okay, I give you this money, but you work for me. There are ways that you can help people to, 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 to supply them. As you see, I'm not a neoliberal at all. <clears throat> In, in this sense, and in any other sense, I believe Mexico has a social duty, uh, and I agree with that, but not at the same time destroying Mexican institutions. Yeah, and thanks. I mean, I, I think that last answer, I mean, in a way, it's much more hopeful in terms of a I mean, thinking about your, your essay on Por una democracia sin, sin adjetivos. It seems that in Mexico we keep dropping one adjectives and then adding two other new adjectives. But I think in your last answer, you're saying okay, the way we're moving forward, sometimes we go three steps in front and then we go back and then eventually linear progress. Seeing Mexican history with the perspective of, of centuries, we were not predestined to democracy. I mean, we were a theocracy, and there in the Imperium, and then Caudillos, and then Porfirio Diaz, and then I mean, we've had only 20 years of democracy, and, and we've had this uh, populist regime uh, government. But I think I'm moderately optimistic that democracy in Mexico, damaged uh, and all, will prevail. But if Congress is lost, if Morena gets the, the real majority, then expect anything. And uh, can it happen? Yeah, it can happen. But I'm confident in it. Well, thank you very much, Enrique. We can open it up to questions from, from the audience. So if you... In, with, with the yeah, with the mic. So let's. Yeah, you digo. Sí. Sí, sí, sí. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for you as a historian. But before I pose the question, it goes for the 22nd hour that, that links me with you. You and I share the same school bus for the Connection Salito Mexico, number five. I would jump into the bus and see what you do, and you go the next stop and don't come in here, correct? I uh, believe this for five days a week, the entire school year, primary and probably secondary. Now, that was my question. You mentioned the army as an institution, and you also mentioned that in 1946, I don't know if with Avila Camacho or with the younger man, the militars as an institution, they were removed from the political power, the, the pillar of the pre, the fourth pillar, disappeared. And that remained as that for many, many years, until AMLO came and started in its destruction of the institution, assigning other roles to the militars, the managing of the airports, the ports, construction, and now recently, Mexicana de Aviación. Now, when you think about the incoming government, what does that transformation, what risks does that transformation bring to the new government with a completely modified institution? I will try to make the, the answers brief so there can be more debate and it's so important and and, and, and but that one's for I still believe in good inertias. So the army in Mexico is institutional. I believe that 
And mm. there, I believe that the new president says, we've had, thank you very much, but you don't have um, um, be administering uh, airports and ports and and and, and building uh, roads and building um, uh, the and, um, the Tren Maya and and doing this and that. We we, we want to first we want to, to concentrate in uh, yes in problems like disasters and this and maybe the Guardia Nacional we have to truly try to professionalize the police the police. I think that could, could be done, and I think the new secret and uh, general uh, uh, in command will obey the next president. Um, now, the real question will the next president ask the general uh, to go back? And I th it all depends, it all depends on it. it it depends on the Congress. It depends on uh, on the outcome of the elections. If citizens have in Mexico has been have been very clear within the streets. If there is, and and yes, I I must say that I guess the United States has had will have to have some kind of saying that they are interested in in Mexico aside from the problem of. And Neil and my question, we would also be glad to see a continuity in Mexican democracy. So, as you see, I'm surprised to, to sound, as I'm sounding, a bit more optimistic than I thought no, it would be. So, Moises, you had a question? To you. No? no? Okay. So, yeah, you are with students yeah. voices. over there. Hola, señor Krause. Muchas gracias por haber venido. Francisco Barnes, este, first year student in the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Um, you have spoken about institutions and how the president has attacked institutions repeatedly. Um, I have noticed that one of the big platforms towards which he attacks institutions is the daily conferences, the mañaneras. Um, this is also a platform that he uses to um, discredit the press. So what role do you think the Mañaneras will play in a future administration with a perhaps less charismatic leader in Claudia Sheinbaum? Um, and how do you think that uh, we can work towards having these conferences be less of an attack on institutions and more informative towards the population? Well, as I say, a uh, very good question. The key word is destruction or the, the intent of it. Destructing, uh, destruction of institutions and institutional life. There are institu formal institutions and there are informal institutions. And one the, of the informal institutions in Mexico was a kind of certain unwritten rules of respect. No matter how wild a president could be Echeverria or not vain or authoritarian or or, or megalomania. You had them all, like like the Roman emperors. Uh, they respected some forms. You did not attack by name. You did not use the microphone. You don't. You did not do those things. Because there is a liberal tradition. There used to be a liberal tradition in Mexico. There used to be a liberal tradition in Mexico. Coming from the 19th century, Porfirio Diaz was a dictator, no doubt. But my goodness, did he respect the forms? Elections never used. Cardenas, Cardenas never. Otto a word, he was a sphinx. To use his daily platform to attack and discredit the press, the critics, I have the honor to be, have been attacked, including, including today, probably the number is 394 times. 
One every three mañanera is, uh, is attacking me. This has to end. It has to end because it, it doesn't serve any other purpose as to divide and polarize the country. To plant the horrible seed of hatred, which has never been a feature in Mexican life. Strife, yes. Conflict, yes. Violence, yes. Hatred, no. Not hatred. So this preaching of hatred has to end. I don't see Claudia Sheinbaum uh, waking up five o'clock in the morning and having uh, her mañanera three, three hours. And, 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 and I see her more as an academic and, and try, trying to fix, she will have to fix a few things aside from, from, from talking, you know. I, I, I don't see her doing that. So that is another institution that has to be rebuilt. Let's say the imaginary virtual institution of some kind of concord, some kind of respect. If that doesn't happen, and if he keeps on, I, I simply don't see what is all as an ex president having all the the, 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 the limelights, and the, I, I don't see that. So I think that will change. But I want to tell you something. It really has harmed uh, in, in, in ways, because it has harmed the, the invisible net of, uh, of feeling that we are all Mexicans. No, that there are many injustices, but that we are all Mexicans. And, but, well, he started very strong, and the Mañanera was very important and popular. I don't think it is that popular at this moment. And every day that passes, some people are awake. No, some aren't. I think among the many things that Claudia has to fix, will be that. And if she doesn't, it'll be bad for her, but for Mexico, but bad for her too. So Moises, and then, and then over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you, Enrique. I, I'm fascinated by the panoramic view that you gave us of institutions and how, how they are mutating, how they're being attacked, how they're resilient, and all of that. So. I want you to continue, continue with that analysis, but talk about the media, the narcos, and the private sector. How the private sector, narcos, and who else? Media. The media. How, media. The media. How have they, the same analysis that you made for the okay. other institution? Yeah. Okay. Disappointing. Well, be disappointed about the narcos. Uh, yeah, you know, Lopez Obrador started the so-called policy towards violence and crime, saying that he, it's called abrazos y no balazos, hugs, not bullets. Well, we didn't ask for bullets, but you don't fight crime since the Hammurabi uh, the times since the founding of the world, since the Greeks, you, you don't fight crime with hogs. We don't fight evil with hogs. It was one lesson in human history. I mean, this is not the way it will be. But let me tell you, evil exists as we can witness every day, every minute, every second. You don't combat it in society uh, with hogs, not with bullets, but with justice and the law, the rule of the law. So by being 
so indulgent, let's put it that way, with the narcos and with crime, he has not only strengthened those organizations to an extent which is, I'm not an expert, but I understand it's unbelievable and, uh, the evolution of these groups and this is how they dominate part of the landscape to the extent that Mexico is not Mexico anymore in many parts of the country. But also giving the free hand to the tiny delinquent in the streets who feel completely free to do what they want. That's my first answer. Businessman. The small businessmen and the middle-sized businessmen who have some organizations but not political power have been both, have been heroic in many ways, but have no public voice. They've been both because they uh, survived of it with not one dollar and not one peso of support of the Mexican uh, government. And they are there. Now, big, big, big businessmen. Lopez Obrador hasn't touched them at all. In fact, he's a, a good friend of many of them. So, in my opinion, how to put it, they have pillaged their businesses, they have grown, and they are hoping that, yes, the six years rule will, will finish next year and the business will survive. This has been a bad year, bad time, but, but what can we do? Yes, they've been, let's put it currently, very passive. The same can be said of the media, the big media. In Argentina, or in Chile, in Argentina, uh, and the big television companies and radio companies and, and the, the news are, are, are of a very diverse uh, um, um, the position, and you have strong crisis and of the um, president. Not in the case of Mexico. Uh, in TV, you see very, very scant uh, criticism. And what's, what's worse is that they, many of them, simply reproduce what Lopez Obrador says. And you see, in our country, in Mexico particularly, if you come out in television, if you appear on television, that is a value in itself. People would greet me in, sometime in the world and say, congratulations, uh, Mr. Klausik. Uh, thank you. For what? Well, no, no, I haven't got you. But you were on television yesterday. So it is uh, a value in itself. It's like, oh, it's, it must be true because it's in television. That is, uh, that, that, that is the answer. So media has been passive. I wouldn't say complicit. As it was fearful, probably, because there are concessions that the government very easily can withdraw. In my opinion, they should have been much, all of them much, uh, if not much, a bit stronger and dignified in saying there are limits, there are limits. But History will, history will judge. Can you switch me your mic? You're reconnected. I hope you've been listening all right because, no. Well, Senor Krause, first and foremost, thank you for coming to talk with us today. Building on this question of the press, I wanted to ask you if you think that the Mexican press's coverage of López Obrador's security strategy has been nuanced 
inadequate so far? And more importantly, what do you think this coverage will change about the 2024 elections? Not only here in the United States, where a lot of Republicans have called for an invasion of Mexico, but also in Mexico itself, where the changes are undergoing. You mean the, the American press, the coverage of the American, the Mexican press? How does the Mexican press has been covering what has happened, what will happen? May I, I would like to touch a bit about also the foreign press because, well, I have a good opinion of some newspapers that have been doing in a very difficult uh, environment uh, with the, the shrinkage of uh, of advertisement and and and, and the and the explosion of the mass media. They've been doing they've been doing all right. I mean. Like in the United States during the Trump uh, era, you had the Washington Post and New York Times. We have had some newspapers in Mexico, mainly the Roma, I must say, but also some somehow Universal and others. And uh, uh, but with very limited resources. Luckily, now the the um, the American international coverage. I have a higher opinion of the European coverage, mainly the English coverage, than in than in uh, than uh, the newspapers in the United States. But they they should they should do. Uh, I don't think that they are conveying the the real complexity and the dangers that we have been going through. But again, I cannot, I don't complain because had you lived in the 80s and in the 70s and the 90s, let me tell you, Mexico and Latin America were almost completely in, uh, forgotten for this press. So, and grateful, at least they, they cover it. They should cover it with, this should change in 2024. Make no mistake. 2024 is the most important election in Mexican history that I can remember. That I can remember. Not only the presidential election, the Congress, very important. In 2024, 90 years of in, in, in continuity, continuity of the rule of six years, we will have a very important election. And the big Mexican democracy will depend on those elections. Does it ring the bell in the United States? I think it does. No, not Mexico, but 2024 is also an important year for the United States <laughs> in November. We'll have it in June. But I would say I am I think that 2024 will be in the United States a real moment of a trial, a historical trial. What will happen here in the US. Mm very close to the 250 university anniversary of the independence. Well, in some ways you can say the same in Mexico. 80 years of stability, 90 years of stability in the transmission of power and 20 years of democracy, they'll all be tested in 2024. I hope there is a serious coverage of what will happen. But we have, alas, a lot of competition because many things are happening in the world now, as you all know. So let's take that, that last question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Thousand, for, for this conversation. My question is on the biographic uh, leaders. Well, AMLO and Bukele are among the most popular leaders in Latin America. So, and I believe they perfectly fit your definition of, of biographic leaders. Now, so my question is uh, whether 
certain Latin American societies are particularly attracted by figures with prone to a biographic style, or perhaps we should wonder if those styles work in certain situations. Because if we are seeing that those leaders get that much popularity, so perhaps this biographic style has some positive features in it. I don't know what is your take on, on my statement. Thank you. I, 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 I'm ready to think that uh, the, the attraction of a leader is something that Max Weber uh, studied uh, uh, in his sociology of power, a charismatic leader, a kind of transition from religion to politics, and it is ingrained in, in human beings, and it, it's there always and will always be. But we have all the concentration of the media concentrated in one man that speaks three hours every day, and it floods the media and the social media with this message, and actually is completely devoted to that. It's, 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 it's no surprise. And then there is the tradition of the Calvillos, of the strong man. In the case of Okello, it's a strong man. Here comes a strong man. You know? Well, uh, but I don't think that we should generalize. Latin America has many countries, and every country is uh, unlucky, but unlucky in its own way. Uh, like Paul Spurry said about marriages. Happy marriages are all the same. Unhappy marriages are all unhappy in their own way. So, uh, Chile, in my point of view, even Argentina and Colombia have institutions and debate and freedom, a judiciary. Venezuela is much less lucky. Brazil is, is better because you have another history. Uh, Mexico has a Mexico's Mexico is on the brink. Will it stick to its Caudillo charismatic past or will it learn and become a democracy? Well, here we are. I bet I think we will to have a it is impossible to have a um, the perpetuation of charisma, because there's a 60 years goal, and uh, charisma is not something that you inherit. I give you, Claudia, this charisma of mine, take good care of it, no speak like me, talk like me, dress like me, talk a lot about me, and you'll be fine. Well, yes, he, she could she, she do that, she could do that. But charisma is not something that you inherit. So I think with that, that, I mean, nobody has invented the charisma pills yet. No, no, the charisma is luckily, luckily. We can wrap up, it has been a, a very interesting, thoughtful and, and, and complete conversation about, I mean, your book, your, your, your career, and obviously the current state of Mexican democracy and what uh, we should be watching for 2024. And we will definitely be reading what you write in the next eight months about this. Thank you very much for... Thank you very much.